Hello there and welcome along to this, the best of all time. On the 7th of September 1892, the first gloved heavyweight championship of the world was fought out when gentleman Jim Corbett beat the seasoned bare-knuckler John L. Sullivan in the 21st round. Boxing has changed since those days, but one question that over the years has caused more fights outside the ring than in it, who is or was the greatest heavyweight of all time? Lewis or Marciano, Ali or Tyson, not to forget the likes of Dempsey or Johnson, or any of the other greats of the past. And tonight I'm joined by three guests who have the unenviable task of naming the best heavyweight of all time. It's a pleasure to welcome for 10 rounds of debate. A unanimous decision is the only outcome, I'm afraid. First up, Barry McGuigan, better known in the ring as the Clonus Cyclone in his fighting days, world featherweight champion back in the mid 80s, now part of our own team on Sky Sports. Welcome, Barry. We're also joined by Colin Hart, the boxing correspondent of The Sun, who's witnessed most of the biggest fights in the world over the past three decades and more. Great to be with you, Colin. And by Reg Guttridge, one of the best-known commentators from the age of television and radio. And between them, these boys know all there is to know about boxing. Why don't we start by going through some of the contenders? As we do that, we're obviously going to pick out some great fights from previous eras as well. But, Colin, one thought. We've all witnessed one of the high points of this sporting year in Las Vegas, the meeting of Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield, and the incredible show business razzmatazz that surrounds a big fight in the United States. But... You've reminded me that this is nothing new in boxing, going way back into the last century. Absolutely. I mean, the World Heavyweight Championship has always been known as the richest prize in sport. And the World Heavyweight Champion, from whatever era you care to, to name, has always been one of the most recognisable people on earth, known worldwide. Mm. It has that charisma to it. And uh, there's been some wonderful uh, examples. As you say, Gene Tunney, Jack Dempsey, Jack Johnson, Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano, you could go on and on and on, uh, covering the whole century. There have been one or two heavyweight champions, of course, who are not very well known or remembered. People like Jack Sharkey. Uh, Max Schmeling was famous for the Lewis fight, not for the fact that he, he won and is the only world heavyweight champion to win the title on a, on a disqualification. As theatrical events, has heavyweight boxing always given us one of the, the most dramatic events in sport. Oh, I absolutely. Think. I mean, if you remember um, going back in history, the first million dollar gate was when Jack Dempsey fought Georges Carpentier. That was a lot of money uh, oh, in, back in, then, wasn't Oh, it's it? the first million dollar gate. Um, I mean, never been known before in the history of the world. And going back even further, when Tex Rickard, the famous American promoter, he was the one, I suppose, who brought the World Heavyweight Championship into world recognition. Every corner of the earth knew that there was a World Heavyweight Championship taking place. Everybody wanted to know the result. And it was Tex Rickard through Jack, uh, Jack Dempsey who gave the title perhaps the first glamour, hint of glamour that it, it's maintained throughout, throughout the years. I guess even before the age of radio and television, the, the great message, a medium for these stories, was the newspaper. Yes, the, 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 the telegraph, in fact where they used to uh, tap out the results and the report of the fight in Morse code. Mm, as, as it happened when, uh, I believe, Fitzsimmons uh, uh, beat Corbett for the title in Carson City. I, I can't remember the year, but it was before World War I. Reg? You know, it, they still kept that Morse code going, even to the 50s. Because the fight I did in Chicago with Ray Robinson and uh, Carmen Basilio, they'd only just stopped using them. In fact, one Western Union operator was still using them. And the newspaper fellows, we had what was then called Telex, but at least you could sort of look over and this single tape came out those days and you could see what you'd written. But with that Morse code, you were just hoping this guy was doing what you had written and it would appear in the paper, not, you know, my way and not his way. Television and, and before that radio must have done so much to spread the popularity. Oh, absolutely. Of I think radio, I mean, they still talk of the Tommy Farr and Joe Lewis or Louis, as we call him over here, fight. I mean, everybody would tell you, oh, I listened to that on my crystal set. Mm. And were, yeah. All the miners in Wales, everybody had a day off. None of the night shift were working, you know. Media, media has played a, a vital part, actually, in it. James J. Corbett is the man that we start with, Barry, from the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. What do we know about him? Well, he was the first real boxer. Before that, we had uh, John L. Sullivan, who was a, a strong, <coughs> robust, big, heavy-handed guy and, and would bludgeon you to the floor. You know, James J. Corbett was the first sort of fancy Dan, as it were, a beautiful boxer and uh, a good mover. He didn't move that much because they couldn't. I mean, many of the, the days, the, the rings weren't great. But he, uh, he was very mobile and he used his boxing ability to frustrate and to uh, outbox and wear down uh, the aging John L. Sullivan. Mm. You know what I think? I think 
Errol Flynn might have beaten him. I mean, mm. Errol Flynn took, took his part in the film, and from looking at these crotchety old films, and I do make allowances for that, we get a different conception of a fight sometimes with those black and white flickeries. Uh, but I wasn't very impressed with Corbett from that yeah. point of the film, and I think old Errol might have had a shot with him. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me this, Reg, why, why did we move away from bare-knuckle fighting to, to gloves? Was this for reasons of good taste or safety? Yeah, or a, little bit of, a little bit of both. I mean, uh, they had to bring gloves in there. I mean, they, they're still trying to alter things to this moment, aren't they? Yeah. Something else has got to be introduced, heavier gloves and so forth. Yeah, I think there's a question of law at the time. To make it more civilised, I suppose, because uh, uh, if the funny thing is, you know, if we really sort of get into the technicalities of it, and I don't want to do that at this stage, this is not what this programme's about. Uh, in actual fact, when, when they, they couldn't wear gloves, they couldn't hit as hard, because it would hurt their hands, and therefore they couldn't punch as hard. So they introduced gloves to, to, to make the fi fellas' faces less, uh, less marked up. Um, but it also allowed guys to hit, hit harder. Hit you know, when you yeah, think more power. Point, when gloves true. first came in, they were two ounces and four ounces. Now they're ten ounces for heavyweights. Mm. Now, could you imagine punchers like Joe Frazier, George Foreman, oh. Mike Tyson, Joe <laughs> Lewis, wearing two or four ounce gloves? Do you imagine the damage that those guys would have done? And the other, the other thing is, uh, Colin, that they used to use horsehair. They didn't bring yeah, yeah, foam I... gloves in until the 60, late 60s, early 70s. They used to use horsehair, yeah. and in fact, in some countries, they still use them, a combination of horsehair and foam gloves. Barry, that, 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 those horsehair gloves were used in the 63 fight with the then Cassius Clay and Henry Cooper. They were horsehair gloves, and the tear that we all talked about was actually on the, the thumb of the stitching that come out, and there are pictures out, Monty Fresco took it actually, of the hair flying out in mm. the round before they mm. tried to change it. In fact, it was never changed. But you're quite right. I remember very well as a kid because all my family were involved in boxing, the instructors and everything. And they'd come home and I'd always be trying to break up the hair gloves for them and make them a bit softer for the fight. That was the cheating going on. Yeah. Can we go back to the uh, Corbett? Uh, yeah. When, <coughs> when he lost the title, which was to, um, was a tenuous link with Britain, of course, mm. uh, Bob Fitzsimmons in Carson City. That fight was famous also because a new punch was introduced into boxing by a newspaper man. Um, I it think it was you, uh, wasn't it, Colin? Well, it, it, it wasn't you. Was, <laughs> it was it there the all family? the time. Uh, it sounds like but, a sound uh, story. Barry was reminding me that uh, it was Fitzsimmons' wife who yelled out to Bob, hit him in the slats, Bob, and she meant hit him in the body, and he did. I think it was the 14th round. He hit him with a body shot, and all the air went out of Corbett, and he sank to his knees and was counted out. And a newspaper man invented the punch. He called it the soda plexus punch, which hadn't been heard of before then and of course it became part of boxing okay. law when people got knocked out with a body punch it was a became known as it was the Fitzsimmons soda plexus punch now Colin we know you weren't around on the 17th of March 1897 when this <laughs> when this did happen when Bob Fitzsimmons captured this world title how much impact did that have in Britain at the time I don't think it had a great deal of impact in no, Britain at all so. I mean yeah. don't forget Bob Fitzsimmons was born in Cornwall I think it was Helston, was Helston, it? Helston, yeah. And then he went to New Zealand as a very young child. And when he won the World Heavyweight title, despite what we may think, he was an American citizen. He was an American citizen, that's right. So the link with Britain was tenuous. It was only years later when we were striving to find a, a man to win the World Heavyweight title that we claimed Bob Fitzsimmons. Mm. Uh, but I don't think it had any impact in Britain, particularly the fact that he was born in Cornwall at that time. And people forget too, Colin, that he just didn't win the heavyweight title. He was he never weighed more than 165 pounds. And when he won the title, he actually weighed 168. He won the nice. heavyweight title. And he went and won the middleweight title and the late heavyweight yeah. title as well. So he was quite an incredible fighter. But at that weight today, Barry, he wouldn't have won a round, let's face it. These yeah. fellas have been much too big for yeah, him and throw too many punches but for But to him. be he, fair, Reggie... He was a bit of a statue. In those days, they weren't, the men weren't that big. I mean, uh, people, people right. don't realise that Jack Dempsey, when he won the world title, was only 13 stone three. That's right. And, and going into the 50s, Marciana, when he won the, the night he won the title, weighed 13 stone two. Mm. Our Henry's best weight was 13.5. Yeah. yeah, 35, so cruiser weight. But it's yeah. interesting. Even a light cruiser weight. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting now that, that we have the 21st century heavyweights, guys that weigh 17, 18 stone. But to my mind, I don't know how you feel about it, Muhammad was 15, 15, 7, 15, 10, never weighed more than that. Tyson was 15, 7, mm. 15, 10, and Holyfield, 15, 5. Yeah, really. So, uh, uh, you know, 
Well, is that the best weight division? Well, or is that the best weight so. in, in the heavyweight well, they're division? They're very mobile, aren't they, all those you've yeah. mentioned. I mean, mobile fighters. I mean, I, 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 I can't get I'll over the size beat, of these guys yeah. now. When he beat Lister.